welcome to our Liber R Stats Club. Keenan and Jade kindly volunteered, I mean, proposed the idea and volunteered to present on Jupyter Notebooks for R. Um, so thank you very much for doing this. Um, this is brand new to me. Yeah, no, our lab uses a lot of Jupyter Notebook. And so we have some uh, wikis and stuff that go over how to use it. Uh, but this is our stat. I, I wanted to just kind of introduce how you use R in Jupyter Notebook, but, but also uh, a bunch of other stuff. So this is pretty much just going to cover what the project Jupyter is. And you guys feel free to ask questions. Uh, installation, which I, I, I hope you guys have already done. But and if you have any problems, we can discuss that. And then cell dynamics. So if you're familiar with um, R Markdown, uh, where you have individual cells, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some shortcuts uh, to use to make it flow and easier to write without having to take your hands off the keyboard. And then again, your keyboard shortcuts, and then just like a, some graphical stuff, some like practical examples, and then saving, converting, and viewing Jupyter Notebook like outside of the environment and you know sharing and collapse. So, what is Jupyter Notebook? Uh, it's pretty much this pretty big project uh, developed primarily from uh, IPython, which is an interactive Python. They've expanded it extensively so that it's like some 40 languages you can write in it. But this is just kind of a statement I pulled off from the website, just saying pretty much what I said, open source and stuff like that. Uh, when you're kind of looking at the Jupyter project, they have a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, the important bit is that we're going to be using an R kernel instead of the Python kernel. And that communicates with the Jupyter client, which can normally be the notebook. And you can have that in a hub or Jupyter lab. And then there's some other stuff. The converting, if you're doing this with a command line, uh, and then this format, which is how they kind of, which is like embedded and then the viewer. So as I was saying, it supports more than 40 different languages, including Python and R and Julia and pretty much everything you want to do. Uh, I only use it for Python and R because I don't need all those languages. Uh, but if you did, it's fantastic. Um, and then you can share it relatively easy specifically in GitHub. So if you're just looking at a GitHub, you can literally see like it's in the notebook viewer. Take a minute. And if you go to the notebook viewer, they've got, you can put the GitHub repository where the Jupyter notebook's in here and then it'll immediately follow up you can't interact, but you can look at it. And they have books written in Jupyter Notebook, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so you can see how like, they've got equations. You can do inline code, which is just kind of a cool example of how they write and, and have code in, in the document. So you can like write a paper if you really wanted to. Transitions are a little slow, but okay. And then you can input images. If you know how to write in HTML, you can put that in. If you want to write your equations, you normally put that in LaTeX format. 
and then if you're doing big data, uh, they have the uh, Apache Spark plugin where you can connect remotely in the R language. And then so kind of this is like the, the main features of Jupyter uh, project where they have code uh, highlighting tab completion. So you don't just like if you're using R studio in the editor window. And then you can convert and share, you can put in all kinds of cool things. Uh, it's split up into the notebook environment, the lab environment and the hub environment. The notebook, if you guys are just kind of launched it is just like this. Uh, this is just the notebook. And then the lab, this is custom themed. So if you, if you don't like white on white, you can just go in and customize. You can do that with the notebook. And then hub is if you're like a company or a classroom. We don't have one yet, but I have been championing my uh, uh, Apua about getting one for, on one of our servers. So it kind of why we, why you want to use it instead of maybe like our studio. When I think of our studio, I think of it more of as a developmental platform where you've got separate sections um, that you really have to move back and forth. While the Jupyter, you can just kind of write it all out, mark down in one code or actual code in another more like an easier format for our most markdown. I know they're doing some improvements with the R Studio where you can have something similar to Jupyter Notebook, like I think like R Notebook or something. But if you don't want to do this, is I think this is a really good um, alternative, especially when you are um, a computationalist and you need to share this with the biologists in the lab. Uh, we use this a lot. So like Tomoyo and Lara, they're not huge computationalists, but we can send our notebooks to them and they have enough R background where if they want to change um, a variable, want to see what it looks like somewhere else, they can make a copy of the notebook and then play with it. And they, it's not too hard. And uh, So if anybody had any questions about installation, I had this. Uh, where the browser, that's just the link. The Jupyter Lab sh should be a, a, a different link. And this is an example notebook. Yes, I recommend if you're on like a Windows platform, and I'm not sure uh, about Mac, to install with Anaconda. It's just such, such more simpler. Uh, and then, so you have everything you need, uh, you'll, you'll want to do the R kernel. This is required to do Jupyter. And then some essentials that's got like ggplot and some other stuff in it. Uh, and then of course, these are so, just my notes. Um, yeah. So you're using Anaconda in this, you're installing R. True Anaconda, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, switch over to my VM real quick. Okay. So in Anaconda, it's got R in it. The R is not gonna be the latest. Neither is the Python. Uh, which is like one of the only downsides. You have to be using whatever Anaconda has installed. And I know there's been some issues with package management in R anyway. With that said, it's the most, it's the simplest way of using Jupyter. If you had Anaconda, then you could just launch Jupyter Lab. And the installation of the R kernel can be done by using the 
PowerShell prompt, and you just type in the code there. You don't have to worry too much. If you're a Mac, you can probably just install Jupyter uh, Notebook in, in Jupyter Lab on the terminal. I don't have a Mac VM, so I haven't troubleshooted that. But I do know this works a lot. And it's pretty quick. I don't normally use Anaconda because I'm on Linux. But if anybody had any like questions, can, you can, can you access uh, files um, outside of your laptop, or is it only with files in your laptop? Um. So if I go, if I'm in Jupyter Notebook right now, launch from Anaconda the base file shows all the folders in this computer on and so i downloaded earlier today the jupyter notebook uh, from google collab and it's in the downloads and it links just fine um, Or I guess another way of asking the similar question is, do you use Jupyter Notebooks on clusters or servers where the big data lives? Yes, it's slightly more complicated. Um, what we do is we have a tunnel, we have a lab tool that will launch Jupyter Notebook uh, using the SSH tunnel. Uh, let me go back. Uh, we're still working on the documentation and stuff. Uh, and it's a Python, it's written in Python. So you, you have to have Python installed for it to work. This is like inception. Our Jupy code will launch an SSH with a, the L tunnel to whatever host you want to put it in. And uh, I've gotten it so that it should launch on Gypsy as well. If I remember my Gypsy. I think you're missing a zero one, right? It's yeah. gypsy zero one. Yeah. JSPH. Yeah. And then it'll launch a for us, we call uh, Firefox, but that's, that could be edited uh, in the, the code if necessary. But this is Gypsy. Uh, as and it, it opens uh, Firefox through X11? Or is this the Firefox on your own laptop? On my own laptop. So it tunnels in it, and then it, um, opens a instance of Jupyter Notebook and it scrapes the location file, which you would normally just copy and paste into your browser. And it does that instantly. Uh, so you don't have to log in, go to the folder you want to, then launch Jupyter Notebook uh, without a window and it'll give you this link you can put in a browser. And that's on your computer. But you're working in Gypsy. Okay. And so and it could, can you, okay, so this is um this is Firefox on your laptop uh, communicating with Gypsy through the tunnel. And so yeah. then you can like, I don't know, use the different versions of R that we have, QRSH, all of that stuff, right? Yes. Um, 
pretty you might have to install the R notebook. Uh, so just you launch R and you follow those uh, instructions for there's a handful of things. I, I would uh, follow this instruction for for uh, in installing the R kernel. But you can also Google it. Uh, and once right. the R kernel is install, installed, then it'll show up here. Okay. Um, and then I guess there's a Jupyter notebook feature itself. Um, do you have like autocomplete for R functions or how do you see like the help file of an R function? Yeah. Like this doesn't have to be with Gypsy, right? Yeah, so it's a, uh, The auto completes. <coughs> if you're in the R kernel, it will auto complete R. Uh, so if I want to, I, I need like a function name. Let's do lots of. And so it's got the whole list. And then you want to know what it is just like if you were doing it, help file, and then it will have print the whole help file here. So pretty much anything you can do in R, you can do in this code here, in the cell yeah. block. The, the links on the help file, they don't work, right? Like you can't just, like if the help file says like, oh, see these other function, you can't click on it, okay? Just um, it's like the text of the help file. I, don't I mean, it's pretty good, right? But like, um, I've never tried to do the links in the help file. Do you know mm -hmm. a good one I can check? I've not checked. Okay, if you do geom uh, underscore point. Right, so those um, uh, at the beginning, it was um, on the very first paragraph. Um, like, um, Bubble? The description Boy, part. So, uh, geom jitter is a link. Yeah, no, this is not a link. It's it's just the code text. Okay. I mean, it's still pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Because it's more. So I guess. Just... So I guess the nice thing about this is that. Um, uh, you can load a big data, right? Um, and then uh, save the output. And uh, like you were to make an R markdown file, you need to save the code, make sure it runs correctly, and then resubmit it, right? So here you don't need to do any of that. Yeah, it doesn't need to run correctly. Um, if you're trying to export it, then it uh, it doesn't rerun all the cells. You have to tell it to run all the cells. So if like a, I want to restart the kernel so it's a fresh and then run all the cells. Uh, if there's an error, it'll stop at that cell, but you can still convert it and share it with somebody if you wanted to with the file export. It okay, so you you. Can you can export something that is not complete. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what happens if, um, let's say there you have, I think, I see numbers one, two, three, four, five, six on brackets, right? Yes. So let's say, for example, right now, code block number six, 
defines a variable called Z that has the values Bob, Jack, and Nancy, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you run code block number six. Can you go then and edit, let's say, code block number three that says two plus two, and then also mm -hmm. print uh, the, the Z object? Will that work? Um, so like- Yeah, you can uh, go backwards. So like, the, it doesn't assume that the code is linear. You can. No, it doesn't. That actually screws you up. Uh, sometimes you'll be at the bottom of it and you'll run everything and you, it'll work. And then you start it again and it a, throws you an error because you forgot to load the library. It starts where you start. So if I were to like uh, start here at where code rate is, now this is, this is one, but it, it, I mean, it doesn't know what plot really is because I didn't load it. And then I can go backwards and now this is two and then mm. three and then it'll work. I think maybe the best would be here to get, um, to, to demonstrate how to get it running on GFC. Maybe that could be later because, um, uh, because like installing it on your computer, right? Then you, that means you have to install all the R packages yourself and all of that. And I'm not sure if people want to be um, doing all of that. Also because some of the data we work with is pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't, so we do most of ours on our custom cluster, uh, but it's the same process. Uh, nobody mm -hmm. has to install anything because it's already pre-installed. Just the, our package is, it is command line based. And I know some people, I, well, I don't know this group, but in general, our biologists, we have to set it up for them. Are you, are you planning like um, uh, on your wiki, are you planning on, on um, explaining how to set it up for Gypsy type of thing? Or a I server. Can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to ask Apua because the uh, the Jupyter tools we have is probably easier than trying to do this on your. Oh, the Jupy um, thing you is that your command Jupy? Yeah, Jupy. It's a, it's under development. Um, but I can do the hard code for, I mean, I mean, we I can, can wait, wait, right? Like, wait, uh, it's, like it's we could pretty, be one of your test users, is it like for UP, right? So. Yeah, it's pretty simple. The command, if you, if you want to do it on a command code, uh, let me, I have to look for, for it. I haven't had to use the GP and any of the actual code for a GP in some time. And then if you version control um, a Jupyter R notebook file, does GitHub um, render it? Yeah, it will um, render your, R, your um, notebook. Let me find an example. And then I, I guess you could also maybe run it uh, non-interactively, right? Let's say you want to rerun a, a Jupyter notebook that takes, I don't know, let's say two hours to run. You can maybe um, write a, um, a bash script that Q subs it. Yeah, we run it in a, a bash script. Um, so you can execute execute it uh, in the command line. And that's where if there's an error, it won't execute properly. Yeah, yeah. so you still have to write like clean code, clean linear code type of thing. Uh, but it's just like, um, like, because like, for example, um, some stuff that I've been doing recently with like Fernando and, and Luis, 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have our R script, and then some of the output, we manually copy paste it from the R console into our R script, comment it out, right? Uh, but like, this could be useful to just create um, a log file that has both the code and the output. And like when we're doing it ourselves the first time, it could show the output interactively, but then later on, if we need to resubmit the thing um, automatically, um, then we'd like automatically update the outputs, right? Yes. Um... Yeah, what you kind of understand but so like here's m my github and here's the Jupyter notebook it's like a non it's a it's a static so you can look at it but you can't interact yeah yeah no that's what yeah it's good if it's um, yeah yeah it comes out nicer mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. some other things but and then all the the links don't seem to work, but yeah, so um, some of the links do, some of them don't. Maybe that one was enough. Um, so I was yeah. just on, let me kind of sh show you how I kind of use Jupyter Notebook in the cluster. Oh, wait, no, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm gonna So we normally execute on the command line here, and then you tell it what the output should be. And then we convert it to an HTML and PDF for uh, reproducibility and sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks really nice because um, let me just, um, can I show my screen a tiny bit? Yeah, give me a So this is uh, what uh, I've been currently been doing, but um, it's not like the nicest thing, right? So here mm -hmm. I'm showing like an R script that we ran, um, or actually I ran this, this one. So I'm loading, I have some R code, but then at some point I print some output. And so uh, from the R console, I copy, manually copy pasted that output into my R script then I comment it out such that like, if I run this again later, it will run properly because this, it recognizes that this part is not code, right? Okay. But what I'm saying is like, with the Jupyter Notebooks, you could probably like, the first time you write in the script, you can print stuff, see the output, right? You can see how it looks. Um, and then later on, if you want to rerun it, you can submit it and it will automatically update all of this part um, without you having to run it. So that seems pretty good to me. Because also, yeah. like, um, let me just show another one. Um, so, because um, um, like, um, when you submit something on on, on Gypsy, um, mm -hmm. you can get a log file uh, that can look like this, 
where you have like um, output from the R console. So like here, there's some like bunch of loading messages. Um, yeah, no, that'll all go yeah. into the notebook. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then later on you can print stuff. So for example, here we're printing some numbers, right? But you don't yeah. actually see the code that created that output, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, so like, what I tend to do is like include print messages, for example, uh, print messages like, let's see if I have any here. Uh, well, that's a big, uh, let me go to the other one. Uh, no, I accidentally closed it. <laughs> um, uh, so like, print messages like this, right? Let's say like, okay, this is where I am, right? Reproducibility information. That way on the log file, you can see it at some point, um, the log, log file. So it's like, oh, reproducibility information. So now I can map between our code and the log file, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like, it looks like Jupyter Notebooks can make this a lot simpler. Um, yeah. And especially if you I can get them to yeah, what what um what like Tomoyo and Lara like a lot when we share the Jupyter notebooks is that they can they see the plot we made, then they can look at the code and they're t using a copy, so it doesn't matter if they f it up. Um, <laughs> they can edit the code by adding like maybe they want to change the shape or the size, and then they see immediately what it looks like, and like no extra stuff has to be happening. They don't know they don't have to worry about what was loaded, how the data was pre-processed. They could just run all the previous uh, block and then edit the picture themselves. Or if they want, I know like uh, Tomoyo and Lara have both used um, Jupyter Notebooks to plot different genes. So we'll plot one gene uh, as like a representative. And then suddenly they've done something in the lab and they're like, no, we want to look at these three genes. Instead of asking us to do it, they take a copy of the Jupyter Notebook and then they write in the gene names. And we just have to make sure that they can input gene name to get the, the plot and win. So it's very mm -hmm. low make. So you're, you're, like you're, you're almost like making it like kind of like a shiny app. Kind of. Um, it's kind of like a shiny app, except that you don't have to add all the like uh, uh, the buttons and stuff to, mm -hmm. to, to things like that. And it's enter in, um, if they do want to make changes, like they want to use a completely different data set, they can do that without having to do a bunch of extra work or us on the shiny app part. Uh. Um, does Jupyter Notebook create um, like cache files or temporary files, right? So like, does it create copies of the big files that we're loading? Um, so it doesn't create copies of the big files, it does save autosave. Um, so if you forget to save, it will autosave. And it does this periodically unless you turn it off. Uh, what we do normally is when we're in Python, there's a function in the function tools package, which will cache. And then if we want, if we're doing, that's why when we normally do our big data analysis, we do it in Python until we get it to a small uh, tabular form. Uh, so it's so much smaller, maybe it's just a, uh, some cleaned and normalized so that it's got just the stuff needed. Then I move it over to R to make pretty plot. And that will cut cache it. It's very, very nice. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to do cache in our studio. Is there? Uh, or, there is with meter and um, not mark on and all of that. Uh, but that will create um, copies of the data that you have. And so mm -hmm. that will get big, right? Um, yeah, uh, we don't, I don't, it doesn't do any caching on its own to do copies of data. The only thing it does is it, it takes a snapshot of your notebook so that you can, if you mess up and you don't remember what you deleted or something and it's been a while, you can just go to a previous save point. So it's more like version control. Um, so the files are not very, the files are not noticeable and you can't, unless you're on the command tool, you don't even know they're being made. I do it because I, I do because I'm, one of my LS commands shows all 
file. So I like the idea of using it on the cluster because there you don't have all these R package issues that you have with Anaconda on your laptop, right? <laughs> right. With Anaconda, yeah. it sounds like I wouldn't use it at all because um, if you can't use the latest version of R, then I don't see any point um, for me because I'm trying to use like the latest R packages, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll but like on the cluster, we can't have the latest R stuff, right? Yeah. Even if the installation is a bit more complicated. Does everybody have access to the to cluster? I was trying to make it so everybody could do it if they just wanted to practice on their own. Uh, but in theory, you don't need to have Jupyter Notebook on your computer at all. Um, so you need to I, have it I on can the work cluster. with you on that. I can work with you on that. So there's something on the cluster called uh, modules. You can um, set up environment modules using LMOD, uh, mm -hmm. which is a software package utility. Actually, uh, Josh and Josh and I recorded a video Monday that's on the on the spreadsheet about some of this stuff. Um, and so yeah. we can install the Jupyter Notebook as a module, and then people could just you know there's a simple command, or we could edit people's profiles on the Gypsy to load the required stuff. Yeah, we could do that. Um, so like all the Python, all all the stuff we could take it care of and make it simpler for people to use. Yeah. Does everybody use G uh, Gypsy who's in the R Stats Club? Is that like the most everybody? Yeah. Um, like everyone that works with Andrew uses Gypsy. Um, okay. <laughs> like Julio, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Ran, I'm not sure, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, Sleep Lana, I think, is in the process of getting a Gypsy account. Stephanie can use it, I think, on the phone Gypsy. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. Okay, yeah. so we have a message from Ren saying that she, that, that there's, uh, yeah. So Gypsy you know is this. <laughs> Gypsy, it's the uh, joint high performance environment. Yes, Computing cluster environment. environment. Yeah. Computing environment, I missed the C. It's uh, with the School of Public Health. Uh, you probably don't have it because I don't think you guys, Greg does any large, data stuff we only like for instance in our lab since we're half and half biologists and computationalists when you add the urban pacola uh nobody who's a biologist has a gypsy account they all have access to the node though our our cluster um so everybody has access to that and they use that so we only use gypsy for really 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 big computational stuff. So anything that's going to require more than, um, I want to say 500 gigs of RAM, because we have a nice R, R node uh, now. It's got, I'm not going to brag, but it's got like 512 gigs of RAM and a bunch of, and like 64 cores. Yeah. Um, so anything that needs, and if we're doing um, more than 100 instances of something, so if we just want to run like all the fast Q files and the brain seek stuff, then we use Gypsy. Uh, everything else we do kind of in the cluster. It's not locally, but it's. Yeah. Yeah, so this really depends on the PI who you're working with. Um, for us, yeah. we found that uh, using Gypsy is, uh, is uh, good, like um, financially, financial wise. Um, yeah. And then we get support from the cluster administrators at Gypsy, um, and uh, we get access to a lot more computing power uh, that we tend to need. Yeah, we, we don't use R a lot. <laughs> so we can uh, uh, go around the high computational cost of doing some stuff, and we can normally work around it. We've got so many clusters, and everybody's on their own. Uh, which is, I mean, it's not the same thing if you're on Gypsy, then everybody's got a nice amount of computational power. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, no, I can't, we can work on the L mod if that's going to be more beneficial to people who are at least, well, at least everybody who's associated with the Chaffee Lab uh, in some sort of way. Uh, that way you can really actually use it. Uh, but again, it's really, really good. Uh, uh, really fantastic and obviously I love it uh, if you wanted to know how to use R and use the R magic function so it was originally for Python so all of the cooler functions the inline code 
are in Python and they have these nice cool R magic stuff uh, where you can write R in your Python or write command line code or Julia or shell or like you can you can pretty much write in any language in your Python. In fact, it can be a completely different different kind of a thing. It's not a big tutorial, but it's just uh it's really only for if you're doing Python and, and you want to use R for a little bit. Yeah, from my perspective, I want to avoid using Python as much as I can in, in some ways, uh, but like, um, but like if we can get the, the setup working, right? Then, um, then at some point it becomes really just about R, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but for, I think, uh, I like, so like, then it becomes a preference thing. I personally like Jupyter Lab. Um, I don't know if you guys looked at the Jupyter Lab environment. They had a free one you can try before you download anything. Um, on the, I think the link in the file, but just. You want to share your screen, Sam? Yeah, I'm going to share mine show you all the cool things. I like the Jupyter Lab the most because you can write in the command line um, and then you can easily find where you're going with this uh, navigation tool and the bar of the find. When you're looking at the notebook, you will be at a hub and then you can navigate, but it's not all in one. And then they, you can do some, you know, this is why I borrowed my sister's mouse. You can do some interesting things where you you can view them side by side, and then uh, and this kind of reminded me of like our studio where you can have a bunch of windows. If you have a lot of big monitor, this is good. I, obviously, on my lap, teeny little laptop, it I'm gonna be scrunching, but you can. You can have two side by side. You can have it down like this, where you've got one that's just looking at code. Maybe you've got uh, uh, the console up too. You can also build the console. So suddenly you have an R console and a Jupyter Notebook and a terminal. Th those are the things you can't do with just Jupyter Notebook. But if you're just, if you're not trying to do everything, um, this is, this is normally just fine. I mean, if you want to change your kernel, you hit the R and then you can go back and forth or you can do it the regular way and change kernel here. So. And then if you want to do learn more stuff, this, this, uh, Markdown had this cool little tutorial. And it's the same markdown they use mostly, give or take, in GitHub. So you're not just, you, you learn it for here and then you learn it for there too. And then I can turn my, shut down the kernel here. Um, have you tried opening the, um this notebook files um, using Cyberduck or WinSCP or one of those uh, SFTP no. clients um, that I will haven't. do the synchronization. Cause like- I have, yeah, I have it. Cause that might make it easier. Maybe they, maybe, um, but cause for example, an, an R file, you can put it from the cluster on R studio using one of these tools. Oh, you mean like moving it with the, the pointer and stuff? So like, um, so like WinSCP or CyberDoc will like uh, copy the yeah. file to your computer and make sure that it's synced between your computer and the cluster. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we don't use any of the, I don't know what the, the people who are on Windows use, but none of the Linux, which is like half the lab, uses by hand syncing. Uh, we use regular just 
navigation in the terminal and then you can port move with open path you, so you can open the file path in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't know. There, you can add extensions and I think an extension might be able to, you can dr drag and drop. So it sounds like that's what you're trying to say, drag and drop, right? Uh, no, let me just show it. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I'm just gonna open like I'm on a Mac computer right now, so I'll open CyberDoc. Mm -hmm. um, um, my computer takes a bit of I don't know why it's taking a while to open. Um, yeah, I, you know, everything is slower when I have Zoom running. Yeah, same uh, for me. Um, okay, so right now CyberDoc connected to the cluster um, and I'm in a specific path. And so I can open um, any file, any R file. You can edit it with RStudio. Or you can choose other tools here, right? So if I had um, JupyterLab installed on my laptop, maybe I could do the same thing. Um, uh, oh, but instead of an R file, it would, it would be like the Python, IPython file. Um, I piped the notebook file. Um, and so what this is, is then um, CyberDoc will download this R file into a temporary directory. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it downloads it into a, a, a temporary directory in my computer that is like, private bar folders, blah, 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 all the R, all the Mac temporary directory structure and then VCL, one, Lever, that's all the Gypsy structure. Um, and then from here, from our studio, because it has a terminal panel, kind of like the Jupyter Lab that also has a terminal panel that you were showing us. So then here, I can then SSH into the cluster. Um, I can request a compute node. Um, QRSH, um, I can access the same directory uh, where this was. Um, open R there. And then, um, then I can execute the lines of code from here Mm -hmm. uh, from my R script to the cluster, uh, to the terminal, right? So uh, right now it takes a bit of time to load, but uh, um, at some point I can do like library, read R, things like that. And if I edit the script, which lives on my computer right now, CyberDoc will, will update it to the cluster. I'll keep the versions in sync. And so maybe you can do the same thing but instead of .r files with our studio, it could be the .ipython notebook files with a Jupyter lab. Um, so this will maybe get around the need for using uh, Jupyter, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so it's just instead of using the R studio window over here, it will be the Jupyter lab window. Maybe that works. I don't know. 
yeah, I gave it a quick Google it, from one source, which I mean, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, they suggested um, not using them together. Uh, that Jupyter Hub, which is the server version, is a similar thing to Jupyter uh, to the Cyberduck, but a little faster for large files. But theoretically, I think you could probably use it. At least if you're just doing Jupyter Notebook. Um, but all, all I've gotten is recommending Jupyter Notebook as an alternative, so I don't. Cool. Uh, if I, yeah, I mean, this is this sounds like something we should try. Um, yeah. Try playing yeah. around with. Um, uh, um, you know, it could be something that maybe people prefer over these our studio way of working. Um, which is like, for example, I've been do, I've been teaching like Luis and other people how to use this art studio setup because then you can use um, all the nice things our studio offers, right? Like R or the completion. Um, and like, uh, like auto indenting, all those nice things. Um, right, because I mean, our studio was made for our code. Yeah. I, I added a link. I found um, uh, some docs that they were setting everything up. They use Cyberduck for moving files. Um, cool. But yeah. That was like me, a pretty uh, big uh, URL, bioinformatics.readthedocs.io. Yeah, I know. Getting started. Now, for me, the I, I prefer using Emacs to our studio. It's like the same thing. Um, I know, I know. using the ESS. Yeah. Everybody else. That's, that's what I used in 2008 yeah. until 2011. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll ever stop, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Outside of that, only thing is you can make, I made these slides, the slides I was showing you with the Jupyter Notebook. It's just file, export as, and then you've got this slides one, revol.sh uh, uh, slides. That works pretty well. It's slow because it is a little slow when I'm running Zoom, uh, but outside of that, it, it works pretty well. So I, I thought of that when, uh, he, this is an old, our stats club, but you uh, you showed the uh, making slides from our our markdown, I think, and so it's a similar. They're very plain, uh, but yeah, push comes to shove, they work out. Yeah, cool, awesome. I don't know if anyone else has some questions. Because uh, we're nearly out of time. Over. Yeah. Cool. Hey. I put a yeah. note about the GP tools for for connected to servers. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, well, thank you very much, Keenan Jay, for presenting today. And um, you know, maybe maybe uh, some people here will want to try out the tools, and uh, it could be nice. Yeah, and you know, if you have any problems with it, let me know. Uh, I'm pretty good at it by now. Mm -hmm. uh, more people using the Jupyter, the more happy I am. And I know I'm very biased, but what can I say? Yeah. I think it's very good because it's got, you know, especially when you're developing code, because you can automatically see it uh, without yeah. doing too much trouble and then share it. Uh, we like it mostly because it's so much easier to share with the biologist. Uh, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I like it quite a bit. Because, uh, um, I mean, our studio has uh, art notebooks. But those yeah. don't work if your data is not your um, on your computer. So oh. we don't we, we don't have that scenario, right? So, so. Cool. cool. Big data problems. Thanks. All right. Cool. All right. See you. Thanks. Yeah.